education in Lebanon, uh, citizenship and social cohesion. And uh, we wanted to uh, really <coughs> redefine some of the terminologies used. Usually in Lebanon, this topic is often addressed under the ter terminology or term of citizenship, but we wanted to expand this. Um, so uh, today, we decided in this book launch to uh, give to, uh, three presentations talking about three different uh, aspects in this book. Uh, as you see in this book, we have many chapters from Lebanon. I think we did a mistake by not having Lebanon in the title, but it's too late now. Uh, so uh, I myself will talk about social cohesion as uh, the theories of social cohesion and the current debates, and will refer particularly to Lebanon and the educational reform in Lebanon in 1997 and the new one in 2010. <coughs> Um, I will focus on uh, how, uh, how social cohesion is addressed in these two educational reforms. Dina will also talk about her uh, chapter uh, on citizenship education and naturalization and uh, its consequences on some of the debates in Lebanon around uh, uh, citizenship. <coughs> uh, and Mark will, talk, uh, will give a historical brief on uh, the uh, concept of social cohesion in Lebanon uh, since the development of the, or the creation of the state of Lebanon. Um, okay, so to start with, just to explain a little bit about why I was interested in this, uh, uh, in this uh, topic. Uh, in, when I did my PhD in 2002, I was interested in exploring the kind of the educational priorities post-Civil War. Um, because there was a new educational reform, uh, Professor Abbasli was uh, leading and heading uh, this uh, reform. Uh, I wanted to see what are the priorities and to what extent these priorities actually address some of the challenges and the needs uh, following 15 years of civil war. Um, and what I found out in my analysis was quite interesting. Um, that um, Obviously that curriculum placed a huge emphasis on citizenship education. Um, and it was natural that they would emphasize citizenship. As one of the developers told me, you know, they, they brought us into a table and, you know, for 15 years we were sitting behind trenches fighting each other and now we have to sit around one table and develop a, uh, a curriculum. So one of the priorities was citizenship education. Now when we notice uh, the, the concept of social cohesion, and here we might agree or disagree. In my analysis, I feel that in Lebanon post-Civil War, the term social cohesion was primarily reduced a political concept. They were talking mostly about the uh, uh, sectarianism, conflict, peace, rather than the social and economic issues or the social structures within the system that might uh, undermine uh, inequality. Uh, it's interesting that actually the word inequality does not feature uh, a lot in the curriculum of 1997 or the rationale underpinning it. They focus on human rights, 
etc. I'll show you the first slide which presents some of the objectives of the 1997 curriculum. So we notice the main principles underpinning that curriculum can be uh, categorized into three main <coughs> concepts. So there was the cultural, the national, and the social. If you read the three of them, you will notice that they are heavily politicized. So social cohesion naturally in Lebanon was, I guess because of the uh, civil war history, was reduced to politics. If we move out of Lebanon and we look at the uh, discourses on social cohesion in other countries, what do we see? First of all, it is uh, fair to some extent to say that it's a very neoliberal uh, concept. So, uh, and here we notice two models. The, uh, the one that's predominant in the USA is heavily focused on the economy. So uh, inequalities are uh, primarily uh, the issue of a distribution, that the wealth and the resources are not distributed enough. So social cohesion policies and agendas are mainly focused on the distribution of these uh, resources. When it comes to education, the focus is on access to education. It's not much on the outcome of the educational process, but let's get students sent to school. This is actually, you see a lot in Lebanon. And there's the other model, which is, uh, you find it mainly in, uh, in Europe, uh, where they focus on two things, the economy, but as well as the social. Social cohesion was a reaction to the multicultural society thing, uh, which has you know, become obviously a feature of these countries and which was causing a lot of tension. As a result, you see the social cohesion agenda uh, featuring, uh, uh, for instance, in Britain, when they started in 2001, it was a result of the riots that happened in many uh, of the areas that are predominantly of Asian population, you know, British of Asian origins. So the, uh, they focused on two things as, as a result. Uh, they focused on um, the distribution, but at the same time, the issue of bringing the communities together, so shared values and shared uh, and trust and uh, bringing the society together, and we also be, uh, see this in Lebanon. But here we notice two different uh, uh, movements. In Britain, when they started, the emphasis a lot was on shared values. So they actually even defined the values that they want to build, and this we notice a lot in Lebanon. Uh, the values in the uh, curriculum are listed in detail um, then in Britain, the discourse changed, and they said, well, multiculturalism has to be with you know, different values, so they opened the values, and, and they no longer uh, include uh, values in their definition of social cohesion. And now with the uh, conservative government, they went back to, uh, you know, that uh, Muslims uh, has to adhere to particular British values, uh, and, you know, other values are not really welcome. So um, if we want to uh, uh, focus on Lebanon, we notice that it actually borrows a lot from the second concept. So after the civil war, there was a, a great investment in increasing the number of schools, public schools. Um, there was a great emphasis on citizenship education, which was primarily subject-based. So there were, they developed a new curriculum which rely, you know, emphasizes political part, you know, uh, knowing about the laws and regulations of the country. It's very idealistic, very descriptive, doesn't involve at all in politics. Um, many people call this citizens in waiting. We're developing citizens who know about citizenship, but they're not allowed to practice. For instance, you see that the internal regulations for the public sector was not changed at all. In 19, since 1973. Actually, the law in 1973 encourages and makes it uh, obligatory for schools to develop student councils. What you notice uh, uh, happened after the Civil War, particularly in 2000, 2001, I think in 2001 uh, there was a decree by Bahir Khadiri that uh, uh, you know, encouraged principals to really put control of any political activities in the school. And as a result, schools used this as a even, you know, principles particularly to try to put more control on any kind of student movement or student uh, participation. So we notice that student voice is completely absent in most schools. We notice that the teacher's role was not redefined, or the principal role was not redefined. 
Um, as a result, uh, students learn about these themes and values, but they don't practice it, they don't develop it. Um, and it's not a surprise that many um, students say it's a schizophrenia and it's a joke uh, that, uh, you know, what we're learning in the citizenship uh, classroom. Um, I think what is alarming about this very narrow approach to social cohesion, it is really overlooked all of the issues of marginalization that is actually the root causes of the uh, either conflict uh, or uh, tensions. Um, and here I want to go, uh, for instance, and um, uh, explore some of the problems with such discourses on social cohesion. Um, we can say that the current discourses on social cohesion actually encourage the maintenance of the status quo the preservation of the status quo. They don't really challenge the uh, structural problems that might produce these inequalities. For instance, in Lebanon, uh, now we see the highest rates of dropout students in public schools, particularly in, margin in the north, for instance. In uh, some schools in El Basta, and uh, last year, they scored the lowest success rates in official exams. So they are, although we have huge numbers of schools, but we still have, very huge numbers of dropouts, and that's why, because we're not addressing some of the serious issues that really are leading to the marginalization. For instance, I'll give you an example. Um, the dropout rate increases a lot in grade uh, seven. Why? Because the curriculum switches to the, uh, you start learning math and science in English. So, uh, and students are doing very poorly already in Arabic, so let alone to learn and have to do the exam and test in English where they can't even understand the lesson. So if you talk obviously to the Lebanese educationists you know, about the issue of maybe we should actually not teach in English, they would consider this a major uh, you know, uh, threat <coughs> to the Lebanese uh, you know, uh, position in the world as a very uh, multicultural, uh, society that encourages uh, second language or English and French. Um, you see, for instance, uh, uh, in the, these policies, post civil war, ignored completely issues of inclusion, issues of, uh, for instance, in the curriculum, we did a, uh, uh, with my colleague Khalil, we did an analytical study of the textbooks. We noticed that it's purely designed for, obviously, as most curriculum in the world, middle class. Uh, urban communities. We were doing the analysis with some civil servants, and when we talked to them, we told them, okay, we wanted to look the, to the extent to how much these textbooks actually addresses the different socioeconomic groups. They couldn't even understand what that meant. Um, so, for instance, rural areas in the, in the curriculum do not feature at all. And then even if they feature, they often feature as a, uh, you know, a, a drawing. It's not even a real picture. So, um, so this is uh, here. Are, so this is I wanted to highlight the uh, the issues of restricting social cohesion discourse in Lebanon to the political sphere. I think this has created more marginalization and is resulting to more educational inequalities. Um, and the debate really has to shift from. Uh, emphasis on access to emphasis on the quality of education and the quality and the quality of outcomes. Um, but obviously for us it's very difficult to talk about citizenship and not talk about nationalism. For us these two words, even in Arabic, we were yesterday talking about what the word citizenship means. And it's Mu'atan, Mu'ataniye. So it's very extremely related to uh, uh, to the uh, nationality. Uh, and in Lebanon it's very difficult, even when you sit amongst uh, the NGO sector and you say, okay, well, let's define uh, citizenship. In, in England, I guess, we've gone a bit beyond the Europe, beyond the uh, uh, nationality. And we talk about, you know, you're, you're a member of the society, as a result, you are a citizen. And that's what, when we talk about citizenship, that's what it means. But in Lebanon, it's very restricted to, uh, to uh, nationalism. Um, so, um, so this is one of the points that I wanted to highlight. Um, I want to share with you the uh, results of a study which I did, and it's also in the textbook, about the, what schools in Lebanon are currently doing in relation to social cohesion. So what kind of practices has happened since the last 17 years, since the development of the curriculum. 
And uh, so what I did is I surveyed the uh, 24 schools in different areas. And I wanted to explore some of the uh, hypotheses that we uh, have. For instance, is it true that uh, public schools are better than private schools and the problem is in the private schools really are undermining social cohesion. Is it true that faith schools that are increasing in number, particularly after the civil war, are really endangering uh, social cohesion? And um, is it true that mixed schools with different sectarian groups are actually the solution uh, compared to those who are homogeneous? Uh, so, uh, so I explored uh, I took uh, 24 schools with, that, uh, with the, this variation, these different variations, and I explored how do they address social cohesion. And it's interesting what I found. Um, and it emphasizes the fact that many schools still in Lebanon restrict the concept of social cohesion to sectarianism and the political uh, uh, domain. So I'll show you the uh, first uh, model. This I call the passive. So some schools felt that the concept of social cohesion is completely irrelevant to them because they are in either urban, rural, uh, er, sorry, rural areas or areas that are quite homogeneous sector, you know, in terms of sect. So they felt that they really don't have to address it, and according, they, they're doing what the government asked them to do, which is to teach uh, uh, citizenship. So. Um, if we want to describe these schools, they were quite technical. So it's all about passing, you know, uh, finishing the curriculum, uh, passing the uh, official exams, and that's the priority. Uh, then there was a second model, which I think is the most problematic model. This was the avoidance model. So this is, uh, I think, is uh, here where you notice the impact of politicians in Lebanon on education. Uh, so here, these are schools where there's actually conflict. So either in Tripoli or somewhere in Beirut. And this data was gathered uh, uh, after 2008, so after the conflict. So uh, uh, what we saw in these schools, you know, there's obviously a very high tension in these areas. So what's the solution to do? Uh, the you know, solution naturally for them was to depoliticize the school completely to avoid any kind of tensions or clashes. In some places, like in Tripoli, they even encourage the students um, to, from a different sect to choose a school that belongs to their sect. So for instance, uh, if this school, the majority are Sunnis and an Arabic student might come, they will tell them, please, can you go to that school in uh, uh, Tibbeni because I don't want problems in my school. Um, so um, there was, even when you enter the school, you see a sign that says politics is not allowed here. So there is a very conscious attempt to really depoliticize the school space, which I think is extremely alarming. Um, because um, guess what, As a sur it's not surprising that in one of these schools in Beirut, uh, where there were tensions during 2008, students, as soon as they left the school, in front of the school, they started fighting. So, um, and the, what did the student, uh, the principals told me? It didn't happen in my school. So as long as it's not on, my, on the ground of the school, I'm not bothered with this. My role is really to make this space as neutral as possible. Um, as a result, student teachers were not even able to teach topics in a controversial way or in a, uh, to encourage debate. Um, one of the principal teachers in this school, the civics teacher, was actually investigated because they heard she was talking, she was teaching about government. And uh, uh, I'm sure you are all familiar with this, you know, when the master in the school peeks from the window and he looks at, uh, at all the students. So apparently he was uh, peeking and uh, he heard her saying something which he thought was promoting a particular uh, you know, party. So uh, she was called for investigation. She told me, you know what, I, you know, I have to really be very careful about what I say in my uh, classroom. I know my uh, colleague Basel will tell you how the, one of the civics teachers told him uh, that she even has a problem with the uh, color of the file that she has to uh, carry into the uh, classroom because you know it cannot be orange or blue or green, etc. So she had to choose a gray folder. So. Um, <laughs> So uh, it's unsurprising that when I looked at the political attitudes of students in these schools, they were one of the most sectarian uh, students compared to all the other schools. 
because there obviously there's tension, there's conflict, and they're completely, uh, you know, uh, asked to oppress all sorts of political attitudes rather than uh, encourage. And one of the major issues is that teachers are not trained to uh, facilitate dialogue in a classroom where conflict might arise. So, uh, so we understand uh, that issue. So um, the third model uh, that we notice is the uh, multi-dimensional uh, model. So these schools, and they were very rare, I think there was one school that adopted uh, this. But still there were reservations and not the explorers. So for these schools, when I asked them about what is social cohesion, they said, well, it starts from the admission, students' admission. Who enters our school and who doesn't? We want to encourage all students to be able to access our schools, so they give a lot of uh, scholarships to poor people or to uh, orphans, etc. Um, the admission of staff, also they said that we don't want to, uh, 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 to discriminate against particular students and uh, teachers. We know, for instance, as a, as a matter of fact, some schools even refuse to uh, accept teachers who are veiled or non-veiled. So uh, this is a major issue as well in Lebanon. So, um, so these schools for them, it's, it's about everything. It's about inclusion, it's about socioeconomic, it's about the curriculum, even the language of the uh, curriculum. They have many students who come from abroad, so their Arabic is very poor. So they have to adjust the curriculum in terms of language. They even do classrooms for the uh, parents uh, to assist with the language. So um, it's about political participation, student voice, uh, critical and active learning, and it's not surprising that in these schools, they actually scored, uh, they were the least sectarian compared to all other schools uh, surveyed in the sample. Uh, although this school was actually one religious, uh, one sect, they were all from the same sect, uh, which shows that actually it's not necessary that if, uh, you know, if they are from one sect, they would be quite sectarian. Uh, because there was other schools who were mixed, but they were still very sectarian because of the neutralized uh, school space. So, um, just to conclude, and I don't want to uh, uh, to take longer, um, what we are calling for in this book is to redefine the concept of uh, uh, social cohesion, to redefine the concept of social justice in the discourse of social cohesion. At the moment, the concept of social justice is uh, uh, of the current uh, the current discourse on social cohesion is a distributed concept of justice, which really um, reduces the issue of inequality and does not address the institutional rules, the laws, the regulations, the social structure, um, uh, and its role in marginalizing particular groups. Um, and in the book, we call for a uh, relational justice, uh, which. Um, which really tries to eradicate oppression, the institutional constraints on self-development, uh, and, uh, and uh, emp empowers uh, young people. How does this manifest itself in teaching and learning? It's obviously, it's about uh, encouraging active, critical, uh, creating spaces for <coughs> students to really have a voice, encourages student engagement on all uh, levels. So, uh, uh, just to conclude with, I will present to you in Lebanon 2010, we have a new educational reform. So how does this new reform compare in terms of uh, uh, our discussion on social cohesion? Uh, I'll present to you the last, uh, so this uh, slide here summarizes the main educational priorities for the 2010 curriculum. What is interesting is finally we see the issues of dropout. But again, it's interesting that it's defined as dropout. So it's again about access. You know, okay, they access the system, but you know they're exiting. We really want to make sure that uh, we are keeping them. And it's, it's this obsession with access that still dominates the educational priorities. The other day we were doing a study on Syrian refugees. And we, were, we asked the, uh, the person who's in charge of the uh, educational, uh, educational file for the Syrian refugees. And again, it's about access. So they want to make sure that they enter the school. Obviously, all these students don't even speak uh, you know, uh, the language for, of instruction. So we asked her, so you know, how long do you think they, they will stay in the school? She said, many of them are already leaving. So they know that they will leave eventually. 
But the issue is that they want to appear that they're providing a seat for every student. But whatever goes in between this, it's, you know, it's again, it's not, uh, it's not the issue. So, um, so unfortunately, still, I guess, the discourse is emphasized on, on access. Although it's, it's good that at least they are addressing, uh, addressing this issue at least. So I will conclude here, and uh, we'll open the discussion obviously later to, uh, uh, to many of the points that uh, we weren't able to focus on. Thank you. about um, my chapter that's uh, in the book. Um, uh, just to give you an idea of what I'll just try to cover in the next 10 to 15 minutes, I don't want to take too much time from the discussion. Um, firstly, I would just like to briefly open up a consideration of what some of the key terms might mean. And Maha already has gone into uh, the concept of social cohesion. Uh, in, in some detail, so I won't go into that too much, or I'll just touch briefly uh, on that. But firstly, I'd just like to talk a little bit about um, the notion of multiculturalism. Um, before moving on to uh, the focus of my chapter, which was looking at the case study of the introduction of um, citizenship education into the curriculum in England, which um, came in uh, now 11 years ago. Before then, it hadn't been a uh, statutory subject in schools. Uh, before then, just uh, really closing up and really just pointing some ways for um, possible discussion what the broader implications uh, might mean in other contexts, uh, uh, other contexts, in particular diverse contexts, uh, ethnically and religiously diverse contexts uh, such as Lebanon, and what, what, if anything, we can draw from um, the case study of England, of European contexts, which have uh, quite obviously quite different features and concerns um, to, to the focus, uh, um, uh, predominant focus of the book, which, which as Maha said, have many chapters that dealt with the uh, uh, conditions of, of social cohesion in Lebanon. So, um, what, what do we mean by multiculturalism? Um, well, on the one hand, it quite often in the sort of uh, public discourse, it's used just really just to describe describe uh, a context. So it's just really saying, oh look, there are lots of different groups in a place. Um, so just very descriptive. Um, at a different level, though, uh, when, when policymakers use the term multiculturalism, it has a kind of normative intent. That is, it's describing um, policies that in some way institutionalize or, or operationalize the notion of, of uh, multiculturalism. So that, that's just to kind of raise that uh, distinction. Um, also, when we use the term multiculturalism, quite often it's also associated with the notion of group rights. So, for example, the political philosopher Will Kimlicker, his um, uh, sort of seminal work, which was published in 1995 on multicultural citizenship, puts forward um, his idea of, of uh, uh, citizenship, but within a, a, a liberal, uh, a democratic uh, frame. Um, and typically, when, when one talks about multiculturalism, uh, it's linked to discourses on politics of recognition, politics of difference, identity politics, and normally we're talking about claims of religion, language, uh, nationality. And so in, in policy terms, uh, when we're talking about multicultural policies, uh, it includes, for example, um, multilingual ballots, for example, uh, funding for minority language schools, ethnic associations, affirmative action, that might be government ethnic quotas, um, uh, limited self-government rights in some uh, instances, uh, and, and so on, just, just to give, give a flavour. Um, but this is, this is just to highlight that 
uh, multiculturalism is a very contested <coughs> term. So uh, we have many scholars putting forward different kinds of um, understandings and conceptualizations of what it might mean. So for example, Locker and Lukes um, talk about the distinction of what they call hodgepodge multiculturalism versus mosaic cultural, uh, 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 multiculturalism. So hodgepodge um, is where there's very much a kind of mixing, all in the mix, versus mosaic where you've got lots of different communities who are all there, but living kind of parallel to each other uh, and not really uh, mixing, and what Amartya Sen calls multi, uh, plural monoculturalism. Um, Sometimes multiculturalism is, is taken to be a critique of universalism, of uh, Western liberalism. And then there's also the notion of thicker or thinner types of multiculturalism. Um, so uh, more strongly sort of uh, group rights, so for example, um, rights that say the Amish have in the United States, versus thinner forms uh, of multiculturalism. Um, but that both in academic terms and um, policy terms, multiculturalism has come in for quite a bashing. So uh, in, in academic terms, it's argued that uh, what we need really is um, rather than accommodating difference, we should just treat everybody the same. So the notion that Kukafas puts forward, toleration requires indifference, not accommodation. Um, others argue that um, this focus on multiculturalism distracts us from the notion of redistributive justice. Um, and then there's also the problem that um, if one uh, grants certain group rights and gives a certain autonomy to different groups, then what about the protection of individuals within those groups, which sometimes may be illiberal groups, and individuals may be not able to exit those groups if they wish to exit those groups. Um, there's also been uh, criticisms uh, that um, uh, it's linked to discourses on immigration, extreme <coughs> extremism, and nation-state identity. And uh, in the last few years, um, a number of political leaders have come out quite publicly criticizing multiculturalism. So Angela Merkel, Germany, uh, quite famously is known for saying multiculturalism is dead. And um, more recently, uh, uh, Cameron, uh, Prime Minister in the UK, um, talked about how multiculturalism has failed and that instead we need a, quote, muscular liberalism in the face of failed state and multiculturalism. <coughs> Okay, so now I just really want to say a, a, a word or two about social cohesion. And in some ways, it's a very vague, kind of unsatisfactory term. Um, in general, it's about bringing people together, somehow kind of underpinned by notions of trust and willingness to participate. Um, but as, as Maha mentioned, um, what doesn't always seem to be uh, referred to is the notion of any kind of commitment to equality, equality and justice. Um, so I would argue that when, when I like to think about social cohesion, I think necessarily we must think about it in terms of some kind of uh, underpinning uh, of a commitment to equality and justice. Um, and also, a lot is made about different groups getting together, um, you know, facilitating different groups and trust between different groups. So what I call horizontal relations, which I think is very important, but quite often what is missed out in those kinds of arguments is the vertical relation, the relation between the groups and government. If those different groups don't have any trust in their government, then uh, no matter how many initiatives fostering horizontal relations um, are um, initiated, it will only take you so far. Um, now, this notion of social cohesion has been picked up very much by policymakers in the UK and the European context, where, in particular, diversity has been seen as um, a challenge, a potential threat. And so there have been a, a whole uh, sort of spurt of initiatives um, trying to promote common citizenship. And um, this, this discourse became very pr uh, prominent 
in the wake of security threats. So for example, 9-11 in, in the UK, the London bombings of 2005. And education for social cohesion is just not, not only a policy concern in relation to the school curriculum and behind the school gates, um, but in a broader policy domain. So there's a whole raft of initiatives in kind of domain in the UK is referred to as community cohesion. And also uh, the domain of naturalisation, the route for people uh, to apply to become British citizens, which in itself is framed in the UK in very uh, educational um, uh, terms. Um, that this, this, is, this legal sense of acquiring citizenship um, can also be thought of in the frame of education uh, social cohesion. So in the next few slides, I'm just going to give a very brief overview of uh, how citizenship education has developed in, in the English con uh, context. Um, and also just referring to the field of uh, naturalization, applying to become a British citizen. And I'll just explain why I think that's, that's pertinent. Okay, so a citizenship education in England um, was initiated by a review back in 1998, so, so 15 years ago, in what was referred to uh, as the Crick Report, because um, an, an intellectual called Sir Bernard Crick chaired that committee. And they came up with a, a notion of citizenship that consisted of, of three strands. Uh, and these were referred to as social and moral responsibility, political literacy and community involvement. And um, it was, the theoretical ins uh, inspiration was uh, supposedly coming from um, T.H. Marshall's conception of citizenship. So the notion that citizenship is made up of civil, political, and social elements. Um, now, in my research, I um, analyzed um, uh, perspectives from policymakers as well as um, analyzing policy documents. And as you can probably tell from the three strands, the dominant conceptions very much were a moral conception. And I'm just, these are, these are my own kind of um, shortcut terms, just really to describe um, an outlook of citizenship that's very much framed in terms of the discourse around values. And here is the notion of promoting shared values to challenge diversity. Also, there's a notion of a kind of illegal approach, so the importance of, of contract. But the strongest uh, conception that pervaded um, the proposals for citizenship education in England were um, that citizenship education is, is participatory. So um, this was a central concept, that you're equipping young people with knowledge, skills, and, um, and attitudes so that they can go out and act as, as citizens. And there was very much a link uh, with de democracy, democratic practices, and the notion of as, um, having a democratic school ethos. However, in this early formulation of citizenship education in England, identity didn't really figure in any kind of discussion of what citizenship education might mean. And I, I was critical of this um, because I think that um, it's all very well proposing a participatory conception of citizenship, but one has to think, what is it that um, motivates people to participate in the first instance? And uh, one has to be able to tap into uh, a society or community that one clearly identifies with and feels has agency with, with, in, in that context. So in 2007, um, I was uh, involved in a policy review where um, we were given a remit of coming up with a fourth strand of uh, uh, citizenship education, uh, to add to the three strands of the initial proposal of citizenship education. And uh, our remit was framed before, um, kind of a directive that was framed very much in terms of thinking about community cohesion, shared values, and, and Britishness, um, and also taking into account some kind of historical component. So what we proposed was a strand that we called Identity and Diversity, Living in the United Kingdom. And just in terms of content, this was 
to actually make explicit uh, the context within which uh, pupils um, are uh, applying their participatory skills. So, uh, t taking into account that the UK is a multi nation state made up of England, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, um, it has a history of immigration, legacy of Commonwealth, Empire, and also um, the European Union, and also looking at um, the place of, of, of rights within that, looking at extending the franchise the legacy of slavery, universal suffrage, and also equal opportunity legislation. Uh, but what we were very keen to do was um, not to focus on an abstract notion of Britishness and kind of inculcation of shared values. What we wanted to put an emphasis very much on was that their people's everyday lived experiences, <coughs> and also on processes of dialogue and communication in the classroom. Um, so that rather than um, coming up with some kind of abstract list of shared values that students would have to talk about, um, that the emphasis should be on debate and discussion, and where relevant, that history <coughs> would inform such thinking, so as to um, kind of uh, respect the integrity of the new form of citizenship education that have moved away from the old-fashioned civics where there was very heavy content that citizenship education with this emphasis on skills was supposed to be very much a space <coughs> for discussion and debate and critical inquiry so that history where relevant would be drawn on rather than it being heavy on content okay um i just like now what might seem like a bit of a strange shift but i i'd, I'd like just to say a few words about um another uh, policy domain that I was also involved with. Um, and I was uh, invited in 2002 to be on a Home Office Committee that was called the Life in the UK Advisory Group. And this was set up to advise the then Home Secretary at the time, David Blunkett, on what the new citizenship test should look like. And this came into being um, in 2000, November 2005. And basically, what we proposed was that there should be two routes to citizenship. Um, we were given an agreement that we had to uh, pay attention to both language aspects and also uh, civic knowledge. Um, but many of us on that committee were educationists, and it was chaired again by Sir Bernard Crick. And both Sir Bernard Crick and David Blunkett uh, had been in the government department of education, and then moved across from the Home Office. So this notion that um, you know, these are separate domains was, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's wrong to think of these as separate domains, both in terms of the individuals involved, but also in terms of the content, that um, the process by which one um, applied and became a British citizen was framed in very educative terms, uh, underpinned <coughs> by discourses of lifelong learning. And, um, the idea that people apply for British citizenship was fueled by um, policy um, concerns that it's um, not ideal to have large non-national uh, populations um, present that could be alienated, and that uh, it's important to try to provide incentives for people to apply to become British citizens, and that supposedly should increase their loyalty uh, to the state. And, um, move towards a kind of common citizenship. So I'm mentioning this, this raft of initiatives in the con context that this is also very much a domain of education for social cohesion. So uh, what, what might be some of the reasons why, uh, why natural? So um, if one looks to kind of theoretical literature, the moral philosopher uh, Joseph Carrens from Canada has written quite a bit on this. And his argument is that uh, long-term residents in a country have a moral right to a route to citizenship. And citizenship is very important because it's the right to have rights. Um, now in the UK, as I've just mentioned, the policy rationale to increase uh, applications for British citizenship for those long-term residents who are living in the UK was based on an understanding that what's important is the everyday lived experience rather than a particular ethnic or religious origin. 
and as I said, the large, a large non-national population is seen to undermine social cohesion. So promoting common citizenship is seen to promote loyalty to the state and reduce alienation. So education for social cohesion is a broader project beyond the school gates, including citizenship in the legal sense, a route to formal citizenship or naturalization. So, um, now just my last slide. So what are the uh, broader, possible broader implications? Um, so, what I'm saying is policies for promoting social cohesion can't ignore issues of wider societal cohesion, suggesting a holistic approach to education for social cohesion beyond educational policy, policy domain, to also looking at community cohesion and naturalization policy. Now, what does this mean outside of the European context of mass immigration? What, for example, might this mean for Lebanon? And I'm just opening this up as a question. So, social cohesion cannot only mean cohesion between the different Lebanese sects, but that must necessarily address the large, long-term, non-national populations, most notably the half a million Palestinians in Lebanon for several generations. Now, if we look at the education of Palestinian school children in Lebanon, they are taught through a Lebanese curriculum where they're invisible. There's no reference to their own uh, national identity. They have curtailed social, economic, civic, and political rights. Yet on the other hand, they have no route to citizenship. So there's a strong ethical and rational argument for considering a broader notion of education for social inclusion beyond the school days. And clearly this is highly controversial politically, but if there's a, an interest really to commit to a notion of social cohesion, principles of equality and justice, this can't be ignored. The alternative is to abandon a discourse and policy of social cohesion. Once there's theoretical and practical commitment, political solutions can be worked on and reached. Uh, demographically speaking. 
so that many of the public schools are not as diverse as private schools, meaning that we find in surveys, etc., that graduates from some private schools, many private schools, have more open, tolerant views than those from many of the public schools. Um, that does not mean necessarily that I'm taking sides here in this debate. Of course, the debate can be framed as left versus right. It can be framed even as Christian versus Muslim, insofar as that the majority of students in public schools in Lebanon always were, from the beginning of the Republic, down to the present day, Muslims, uh, a great majority. So the Christians in general uh, would be more inclined. And of course, many of the Christian as private schools were Christian. This is changing now, recently, and I have the data in the article. But traditionally, this was also the division. Um, that's what I just do in the beginning, very simply put as well, is to say that this is not just a Lebanese thing. This notion of establishing universal education for all sects, for all genders, for all classes, goes back to the 19th century. We had it in Europe as well. And so I don't think that uh, one should look at the Lebanese case as a sui generis case, but I do think that the Lebanese case, insofar as diversity here is, of course, uh, uh, much more entrenched. Um, is uh, it actually maybe it bears a lesson or two for other cases. I think what we see in England now, what Dino is referring to today, I think multiculturalism is only going to increase in France and England. So many of the lessons we have from Lebanon can be implied, uh, applied elsewhere. Uh, this very university, AUB, you all know it, this is one of the indications of the fact that private schools such as AUB, even missionary schools, could in fact uh, be incubators of a notion of citizenship which transcends Professional identity. Henry Joseph and uh, Ben Bliss, both of them, of course, uh, were saying this. Initially, AUB, of course, was, I don't know how to go into the history of this, uh, had an explicit uh, kind of missionary identity, but later then, this was uh, supplanted for um, uh, sort of a more broader identity. And of course, many of the graduates of AUB, as we know, were leaders of Arab nationalism else, elsewhere. So the notion that private schools, which was uh, very current in the Ottoman Empire, and even later, that private schools are sort of uh, subversive elements in society is not necessarily borne out by the history of, of the country. Uh, I'm not going to go into all this as, as well. This is a very interesting quote, I thought, by the way. This is one from Jamil Kapuk. This is in 1926 when the Constitution was being framed. And I'm coming hopefully out with an article on this, by the way, uh, on uh, the Lebanese Constitution and who was responsible for the professional articles. Because very often we hear in Lebanon, well, it is, of course, the French who are responsible for professionalism in Lebanon. But if you look at, and I'm not a Francophile by any means, my French is quite weak, but uh, I would say that it's incorrect if you look at this, uh, the actual facts. The French, in fact, expanded the public school system in Lebanon, and that benefited, in fact, more of the Muslims than the Christians at that point, because the uh, public schools, as I said, were majority Muslim uh, in terms of their, their student body. And, uh, of course, it was the Lebanese, the Lebanese deputies, who insisted on professional prerogatives in the Constitution. Some of the French, not all, and some of the French wanted to basically carbon copy the French Constitution. And this is why you have the fact that today, in the Lebanese Constitution, this inherent contradiction between which are, for all intents and purposes, carbon copies from the French naive Constitution, including Article 9 and others, and articles which consist of confessional prerogatives, confessional prerogatives. Of those articles, most important to this uh, kind of forum is, of course, I think Article 10, where, which gives the sects the rights to ward over their confessional schools. And this is uh, still there, and uh, it won't go away. This quote I thought was important because, again, I want to sort of de-emphasize maybe our hubris that education is the panacea to everything. And this fellow says something interesting. He says, um, it's not a problem of ignorance, as to say that everybody has to be educated, but a problem of justice. And uh, I think to a degree this is true. Um, and that's why in the, in, the course of, uh, in the course of my article, I try to relate educational disparities to confessional ones, uh, to societal ones as well, and inequalities. And you have, of course, this famous old little graph here. This, is, of course, no longer is true today as it was then. Um, <coughs> Because I think it was done in 1978 by the Mahjian. But in general, this is sort of the picture that we had in Lebanon, of course, and, um, and still uh, some informs the whole rate. Here we have the communal illiteracy rates. This is from 1932, and then the regional ones today. So obviously, uh, literacy has expanded in the wake of these decades. Um, but still, we have more or less, if you want, the Bekaa and Alapia, that is to say the Shia areas, have, relatively speaking, a much higher literacy rate, rate than Beirut and Malta. 
So some of those disparities are there. And again, of course, illiteracy is only one uh, measure of uh, looking at the quality of education. Here again, uh, the, I'm not going to go into this, this is in the article, the number of public and private schools. Just suffice it to say, some of these numbers are deceptive. So um, Lebanon's, uh, I think the teacher-student ratio in, public, in the public sector is in fact uh, better, but the quality of instruction is better because a lot of this has to do with nepotism. So a lot of teachers are hired, so formerly there are a lot of teachers there, but the quality of instruction of course, is, is inferior. And uh, there has been a deterioration, uh, as I said before, in diversity of schools, which I think is very pernicious. That's to say that we can learn from the state schools, and also in quality. So the state schools used to be uh, a better quality in their heyday, but the uh, quality has increased. Uh, um, here again, just the number of uh, private secondary schools. And you see, of course, the increase in especially particularly, I think, uh, uh, Shia schools. Uh, and this is what I was referring to before. Uh, these are my, or no, not mine actually, it's uh, Adem Amin's um, findings. I think Maha has more sophisticated ones again. But basically, the question is of uh, one of tolerance, if you want. And uh, you see that secular schools, of course, win out. But then, um, uh, in a way, Christian schools do better than state schools to some degree. Uh, because also, of course, Christian schools in Lebanon are so I think, I think diversity is the most important thing. That's my personal belief, I think. Just being in the same classroom with people of other faith, knowing that they're the same Demi Adam as you are, is the best kind. Let me, uh, this is the article in French in the Lebanese Constitution, which I was alluding to, which gives the schools to go on. Let me just go to the very final part. Um, what are, we were asked when we were writing these articles, I think by George Asseli or others, to uh, offer concrete suggestions um, to improve the situation. So, Basic first suggestion, of course, is uh, to increase uh, the diversity of schools. The government should sort of encourage and graphic the denominational schools. Maybe this can go as far as busing. I don't know. We have this in America, of course. I know that's a good idea. But something to that effect, just anything that increases diversity, of course, I think uh, should be encouraged. I don't think there should be a zero-sum antagonism presumed between public and private schools. Uh, though I still, of course, um, I think that the Lebanese state, which is quite dilapidated as we speak, and we're getting worse, I don't think so. If we look at the Arab world as a whole, if I look at this as a broad specter, what we're seeing is the collapse of the Arab state. You see this in Libya, you see this in Egypt, you see this in, in Syria now, whatever we want to think of Bashar al-Assad, bottom line is the state is collapsing and this creates anarchy. So uh, I hope this doesn't happen in Lebanon either, God help us, but uh, this is, I think, a, a very dangerous present. Now, of course, that having been said, um, uh, the, the notion of Tawhi, that is a complete unification, which some people accuse of being kind of a fascist vision, of having one curriculum uh, and for the whole you know, history and religion, whatever, uh, might not necessarily be embraced, but something of conceit, that is coordination, uh, should be there. There should be, uh, because right now the disparities in curriculum, et cetera, are, are too, too great, particularly when it comes to tricky issues such as history. There, of course, in history and religion, this is the old question in Lebanon. I think Lebanon has such a rich history. It has the worst and the best of the world, right? And everything. And especially also in its history. We have the worst sectarian strife, but we also have the best instances of uh, intercommunal cooperation. You think of uh, the 1860 riots, you have uh, um, uh, the Father of Jazeera, for instance, helping Christian families then, when the Fatah Islami came, etc. You have Al Zahi, etc. Writing a letter to the caliph saying, "Please protect the Christian," etc. And vice versa, you have Christian militia in the civil war who have acknowledged their crimes against Muslims. So instead of avoiding these tricky topics, include them into the curriculum. This is the way to get about. So I completely agree with what was said before that you know if by sort of shoving this uh, problem under the carpet, you're really going to exacerbate it. And the kids are going to go home and discuss it at home or discuss it. Friends, and it's going to become more obscure. So, this, the, the place where to discuss these issues, and even the tricky ones, is the classroom um, in a very courageous and bold way, but uh, face it. And I don't, don't avoid it. So, that's uh, one thing. Then, of course, I think there should be more leveraging of the many NGOs here. There's an old problem with Lebanon, and many feel. Lebanon has such a vibrant, flip society, a lot of them family based, a lot of them sect based. 
But I, I know this every time I come to Lebanon, I hear, you know, this friend of mine is doing that, the other friend is doing the same thing, and they don't know each other. And I, this is an outsider come here, and somehow I know this. But uh, they don't talk to each other often. And not necessarily, you know, sometimes it's just sheer ignorance or just knowing. Sometimes it's, of course, jealousies. But in general, there should be a leveraging of some of these very uh, noble, uh, I'm just mentioning some of this some actually, NGOs who are working on these issues and uh, doing that. I think that should be leveraged. So I don't think it should be a state. I think Lebanon's um, diversity and its strong civil society, its private schools, shouldn't be avoided, should be, but they should be leveraged there. Under the coordination of the state, not necessarily or you know, something to that effect. That doesn't mean the state has to impose its visions, but it should use what is down there on the ground. And um, I think that's about it. I, I don't really want to say too much, much, much more on this. Um, this is something I did from somewhere else, but if you compare Lebanon to Syria, for instance, in Syria, uh, I think you have the opposite of a way. In Lebanon, we have this very weak state associated with minorities, strong civil society. Syria, we had a sort of military state, and which is now falling apart, and the sectarianism is coming to the fore. In Lebanon, we think of any, everything in sectarian ways, but as I tried to do in the article, uh, I don't think sectarianism exists per se. It always has to be related to the social, political reality, to economic, other disparities. And um, uh, if, if, if that can be done, I think uh, <coughs> Lebanon can leverage this diversity despite all these uh, horrific uh, scenes we're seeing around us. And uh, I will keep it to that. And please uh, we'll look forward to your questions and discussion. Thank you. about the history book. Can you tell us a little bit about how advanced you are in your negotiations with the Ministry of Education in order to produce one Lebanese history book? Okay, I, uh, um, I guess here there are many views. The, uh, in Lebanon, the, uh, the agreement has always been, or the, there's a consensus that we need one national history textbook. I personally think, okay, you know, uh, although I wouldn't personally like to have just one history textbook, but I think considering the situation, maybe we need it, but I think the emphasis should be on the uh, pedagogy or the approach to history. At the moment, history is seen as just memorizing learning events. While we really need to promote a, um, we have done a conference here just uh, less than a couple of months ago about this, uh, a history should be approached as a discipline itself, as a science, a rigorous science that has its own uh, uh, learning objectives, the skills and competencies that need to be developed. Uh, we are uh, currently actually working on establishing an association for history uh, teaching or history education because we think in Lebanon we probably won't see a uh, national history textbook for a very long time because as long as they're trying to reach consensus regarding events, it's going to be anyway a very boring book to read and uh, it is completely unpedagogical. Um, so uh, what we thought in the meantime, let's actually develop the, uh, and build on the capacity of uh, these history teachers who are actually very passionate and really want to do something about this. So I think the way is actually to emphasize it as a discipline rather than uh, trying to agree with a, uh, you know, uh, stories that will probably be actually diverted, changed, uh, uh, in order to uh, match everyone's taste. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, I tend to I tend to disagree with you. I teach uh, students on transitional justice, and uh, so we deal a lot with the civil, uh, Lebanese civil war. And uh, when I ask them their version of uh, of history, it's often dictated by their uh, family and uh, the community schools where they attended. So uh, I, I think yes, you you. Uh, you can, uh, we can imagine better pedagogy, but uh, uh, this uh, doesn't prevent that you need uh, a curriculum where you put also your 
uh, Martin culturalism, your pluralism inside. Uh, I do remember French history where you have the mainstream narrative and always you have a box to say there is people contested that. We can imagine uh, the uh, Mount of Lebanon uh, uh, told by uh, a Christian and by Jews. Two versions, you put the two versions. But I, I, think, I think we should... Um, uh, uh, this is this for me uh, really uh, a big problem in Lebanon. I mean, I see it. And my <coughs> second point that uh, it's about uh, you you put too much things on nationalism. Uh, I think when 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 you say the problem in Lebanon uh, uh, this uh, uh, lack this. Uh, um, nation and the state, what uh, the way we conceive a, a state for one nation and, and uh, uh, drop a lot of non-national uh, uh, without basic human rights, I think it's not because of the nationalism, because of chauvinism, because of uh, 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 sectarianism. Uh, uh, I think that the solution may be the nationalism, to, uh, to, to have more uh, nationalism, because we know that the, the problem of many uh, uh, minorities here, Palestinians, uh, 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 domestic workers, and, and others who protracted residents here, the problem, uh, the fact that you have sectarian is that the parliament is incapable to take a, a decision. These are this uh, minorities. I think nationalism is something uh, great. I mean, why you label it in uh, this uh, uh, way? Okay, our uh, my criticism of nationalism is act in terms of education that in the name of nationalism and by putting it as the main priority and marginalizing the other important issues, I think this is primarily my uh, problem uh, towards uh, nationalism. Also the approach that is nationalism is taught, you know, everything is, uh, is taken as a fact. There's nothing debated, minorities are not discussed. In the textbooks there is no one mention of the refugees, for instance. Although in Lebanon we have a huge uh, refugee population. The obsession is always on let's patch this thing together and bring them together uh, as passively as possibly as possible, and, and this is my problem with it. I don't mind having nationalism in the curriculum, but let's debate it, let's talk what, or how it can be good, how it can be bad, the uh, negative side of nationalism, and also uh, expanding social cohesion from the concept of just, it's, it's about uh, bringing this nation together. That's, uh, that's my problem with it. Thank you. In spite of the great efforts to improve education in Lebanon. I'm afraid we have not articulated a good philosophy for the education in Lebanon. And that's one of the major economic factors for many of the problems. On the other side, relating to the history books, I've attended classes of history back in the 70s in schools, in two schools that were around 500 meters away from each other teaching from the same book on Bashir Shahab. In one place, he was a prince, and the other, he was a pauper. So the hidden curriculum is more important than the unified book in terms of teaching. As many, uh, as the uh, speaker earlier said, what goes in the classroom has roots somewhere. And this is going to be there forever. They approach many places in the world have sold this thing. We do not need a unified one book, because that's not the answer. And uh, what is needed now for the country, maybe through education, is a sort of a new social contract pact, which will take realities as they are, not the platonic things that all of us would like to have. Each one of us have his or her own idea of what Lebanon is or should be or whatever. There is a need for something to come out of the civil society to, to redefine a starting point rather than the end, which we are always looking for, the greater common denominator. Let's start with the minimum and start building up one <coughs> step at a time. Thank you.
Well, can I just challenge you maybe on that? Uh, mm -hmm. But if, if not a unified history book or even one with multiple narratives, which I think is an interesting idea, what then? The multiple narrative. But that would still be a book, right? That's still sure. Unified. Okay. You need, you need some, if not a, a book, a little whatever. You need a starting point or a springboard for a lesson, fine. Yeah. But that is only the beginning. And as I said, I've heard the same lesson from the same page of Tariq Lubnan, Abu Shahla al Jahar. Some of the older generation might have used that book. It, it was not the only book, but I think at that time, 90% of the schools. It's not the No, no. 90% uh, of the schools in Lebanon used that book for teaching history. And uh, the same lesson was interpreted by the teacher uh, completely differently. I mean, the same with Fakhr Adin, for instance, or whatever. But I, I have both narratives that. next to each other, exactly. and then the students can see at least that they know that there's this debate. Um, can, can I add something to that? Uh, for instance, if we take England, today actually they have a new uh, history curriculum which is uh, horrifying many of the history teachers because we're back to uh, actually Lebanon. So they have uh, a chapter called the, um, uh, the Great of the Empire. So we're back to the old, you know, the typical conservative uh, discourse of the history, which we have now in Lebanon. And unfortunately, you know, I still find that many people still repeat this discourse. I actually think uh, in Lebanon we probably need a history textbook because our teachers are not ready. But if our teachers are ready, I don't think we even need a history textbook. If we, if the objective actually shifts from the story to the process, this is the solution. Because I want the students to be able to take any document to, uh, that they have in their hands and to critique it, to engage with it, to search for alternative views or different views. Uh, um, but if we just teach them to uh, recite two narratives or, you know, just memorize two narratives, that's, I don't think it's at all the solution. I want them to be able to critically engage with the, the newspaper. In England, there, there isn't a, a, a textbook, a history textbook. It's actually, teachers, because they're this extremely fascist, um, they only have uh, periods that they have to study about. This is in the previous uh, uh, curriculum. And the interesting bit is the only two compulsory topics that they were introduced are slavery and Holocaust. And then Holocaust were being, was being taught in a very, uh, again, descriptive way. And then this was challenged. Why do we teach all topics uh, uh, critically, but then this topic has to be taught emotionally, etc. So um, it's interesting to have this debate and this uh, critical view on all topics. And, and I think this should be the objective. Yes, I mean, coming from the English context, as Mama is saying, um, the, the, the history, the, there isn't really um, kind of a tradition of using a single textbook. If anything, teachers see it as a kind of affront to their abilities that they would have to rely on a one book. And I think, as Mama is saying, by talking about a textbook, that's really focusing emphasis on content and facts, which, of course, have its place. But... Um, until the history curriculum had been changed, there been an emphasis much more on teaching uh, pupils how to think historically, how to critique, how to deal with historical documents, how to view multiple uh, perspectives and, you know, read historically. Um, I think, I'm not sure, you know, to take Sari's uh, first suggestion of, you know, in different areas, people's historical thinking is guided by family and community and so on. I'm not sure what an introduction of a unified textbook would do, whether you think that that would change things. Well, it, it, uh, for me, imposing, story, imposing one story. Not necessarily imposing, but uh, at least they hear another story, and then the process, what you are talking about, come to, to help uh, the student to negotiate between different levels of information. I don't think so it's I one of ignorance, though. I don't think people are not aware of the difference. Actually, no, this is what's happening. Yes, I mean, this is what's happening. Who would write the story? Yeah, whose story is it? Like whose story is it? A committee. No, a, a committee, a committee can have a story on something that has essence. It will always be very superficial. It will always, always be very misleading. Things will not be named by their names because they want something that everybody will agree on. That's the worst thing you can teach. That's, that's unlearned. As a history teacher, 
I teach, uh, I teach both the Lebanese program using those, those books that I studied with when I was at school a long time ago. And I teach the French program. And uh, even if I have a book uh, when I teach uh, the French program, the book is there as one resource. I have a wide array of resources available to me by different kind of uh, professionals, historians and non-historians, uh, educators of different, uh, uh, different uh, who think differently. And it allows me a lot of freedom in class to work on those skills that Maha mentioned. Critical thinking skills, creative thinking skills, analytical skills, and uh, communication skills as well as part of a history lesson. When I teach the Lebanese program, I try to follow the same methodology. I find myself really without my, uh, I'm not armed. I cannot find resources. I cannot find appropriate, age appropriate resources. I cannot find a variety of resources, not only text. I want movies, I want documentaries, I want pictures, I want uh, uh, first hand uh, documents. <coughs> It's not easy to find all of this, so a book will not solve the problem. We need um, really a lot of effort on the national level to provide resources, all kinds of resources, and a curriculum that allows some flexibility to the teacher. And then the teacher will address uh, each issue uh, using a variety of resources and allowing the students to analyze them and to draw their own conclusions and to build their own understanding of events. Um, I, I wanted to get back to something, Maha, that, that you mentioned, and I'm sorry for, if I'm cutting off discussion on this very important point. Uh, in my work, I, I say that I work to develop global citizenship skills uh, amongst, among students. And uh, I have very often worked at institutions where uh, the discussion is that there's no such, no such thing as global citizenship because you can't have citizenship if it's not tied to national identity. Uh, so we did a lot of work at one of my previous institutions about citizenship as, uh, more in a human rights sense as being, being a member of the world, of the globe, of the human race. Um, and I would just like to, to hear a, any of the speakers talk about this sort of social element, social co cohesion. You touched on it somewhat. Uh, in your presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, this is, the, I think the problem is with the term citizenship. It almost implies that the citizen is involved, that the nationality is involved. And this is what, uh, we were exactly talking about this again uh, yesterday. And uh, this is the problem. It's very difficult to come out from the term. And I guess this is why in the book we, we avoided using citizenship in the uh, title. Because we thought it's very narrow, people have particular impressions about it, so we, we want to get out of this. Um, but, but this is the, the problem of terminology, although actually what we teach in citizenship does not necessarily have to be related to the citizen and his political right as a citizen, uh, but to all individuals living in this particular uh, entity and all the <laughs> skills that they need and uh, uh, the competencies, the attitudes, the values, the knowledge, uh, to be able to participate in the uh, um, in the uh, society in Britain, for instance, uh, and I think uh, Gina can uh, uh, elaborate a bit more on this. Citizenship is also not uh, perceived as you know uh, certainly related to the political rights or to the nationality. So uh, when they we talk, they talk about citizenship, they certainly do not associate it with that. So I think we just have to redefine the term so it includes uh, you know something beyond the state citizenship. I would say that when you talk about global citizenship skills in the sense of developing that, you're talking about social cohesion really across nationality, across groups. Uh, it quite often connects to peace and goodwill for all mankind, which is a 
really a too broad a reading in my, my opinion. But um, well, there's a trick about social cohesion is that it's not necessarily always a good thing. If you take Germany during the uh, Second World War, it was on the whole a very cohesive society, yet it led <laughs> to atrocities. So it is not necessarily always a, uh, a very good thing. And that's why it's very important to redefine uh, the theory underpinning it. Mm -hmm. And I think it is more than citizenship education, because it's about uh, the system, structure, institutions, and a power relation. Um, so that's why I think it's a bit further than, uh, uh, than citizenship, but I guess citizenship is one of the means uh, for uh, addressing and promoting social cohesion. Uh, thank you for your presentations. Um, I, um, uh, so I'm, I'm coming to these questions as someone who doesn't study kind of the educational realm, but I noticed that the focus is on um, so kind of uh, in Lebanon uh, sectarianism and in Britain multiculturalism, and um, I wonder if you could talk to um, to um, kind of issues of which you talked a bit about uh, Maha, kind of the erosion of the public school system and the growing inequalities in um, the school systems uh, um, and how, you know, how, how that can um, a, a inform ideas about, uh, you know, citizenship or cohesion or... Uh, so I, I wonder, and I wonder if you could kind of bring in the, the inequalities, unequal schools aspect of it. Um, and then, uh, oh, and then again from a kind of layperson's observations of ed education. Um, um, I think one issue, uh, for, for me, kind of one issue of, um, a major issue of education in Lebanon is not so much not having a history book, but more kind of a, a, a more uh, the, in, uh, or, or what seems to be a, deter a deterioration of um, Arabic language teaching over generations, and <coughs> that that um, and that informs citizenship and identity in major ways, and that that I would say is quite a worrisome, um, a, a, a sad. It's a sad state of affairs. <laughs> Thank you. Can we take a round of questions and then we uh, we, we can answer this and then uh, just plunge? I think we need the mic. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Are we alive? This is live. Yes. Um, I was deep into history. Anyone who was in the UK in the last week or so has been just living Richard III. <laughs> um, now, there was enough information um, of his death, of his height, of his bone structure, of what he said to whom and when, um, 500 years to make it alive. Now, I'm wondering whether here in Lebanon, over the, you know, we're only 35 years and we haven't got any facts and figures which anyone dares to put out about any battle. Now, in this battle, there was a huge revolution that's going on in, 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 in Britain. And yet, there was massive information that came out. And also, there was a program where historians from all over the world were having terrible rows on television about what he said and who he was and why he did this and why he did that. And that's a long time ago. And we don't have any of that yet. We don't have any dialogue on them. That's the thing that I'm talking about. We don't have any any discussion about you know who did what to whom yesterday. We don't. We only have versions, but we don't have discussions. So maybe the problem is we cremate all of our uh, <laughs> dead people, so we don't have any bones to really look into. We don't cremate their stories, though, do we? We don't cremate their stories. I think we should bring their stories alive and splash them about. Okay. Um, 
I think it's uh, very <coughs> much related to the comment that was just made, which is that there's, I think there's something in between a story that is fixed that everybody has to believe um, and some extremely pluralistic view where everybody says what they think or you read all sorts of different views um, and then what, you know. So I think, you know, what you're referring to, I believe, is that there is within, you know, the, the academy of historians um, with whatever methods that are agreed on as establishing some kind of, I won't say truth, but leads to some kind of consensus or a core of consensus among most people who work in the field. Um, so while there may be things that are on the margins of a historical account that are contested, usually within any discipline there's quite a lot that's taken for granted and is common ground. Um, so, okay, so there's that, sort of that, that sort of element or of sort of knowledge construction in history, which I think is in between, which relies on the standards of knowledge construction in the discipline, that's in between the pluralism, ultra-pluralism, and some kind of dogmatic, this is the way that it is. So I think that's worth thinking about. So that leads to a question that I have, which is, what is, from your point of view, um, in thinking about civ civic education, citizenship education, social cohesion, what is the role of, of history? Because is it, is it to have a common story? I mean, do you, is one of the justifications for having history um, in the curriculum to help uh, people think of themselves as part, at least in part, <coughs> part of a common story. Um, so that's my question. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, okay, we have uh, so three questions so far. So we'll uh, uh, answer them. Uh, please uh, feel free to pick on any question. Uh, but the first question regarding the public and private. Uh, just, I'm not sure if I understood uh, your question right. Uh, but I think there are different types of inequalities in the public sector and the private sector. And I think uh, the gap between the public and the private is also increasing to a really uh, dangerous state. Um, take, for example, uh, usually demonstrations that happen in Lebanon. I, the last demonstration I participated in, there was hardly a word of Arabic back to uh, uh, that was mentioned during the demonstration. I bet most of the participants were graduates of private schools and private universities. And, uh, you know, they really, there isn't a link between this kind of group, those who are graduates of private schools, and what really goes on in the public sector. So, so the gap is really widening. Uh, both of them, uh, I think, practice different types of uh, discrimination. Uh, you have some of the schools, as I mentioned, they discriminate among, uh, against males or non males people with disabilities, learning difficulties. There, there's dis discrimination in, in both, uh, but it's the different types that is, uh, uh, or the outcomes that are a bit different. Uh, so I guess in the public school, what you see, unfortunately, is the, 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 the huge dropout of students at a very young age, they just leave school. And, uh, a, a friend of mine uh, who was uh, doing a uh, study on those who participated in the 2008 uh, fightings found that actually those who really participated in the fighting themselves, most of them, dropped out uh, of school from an early age. Um, so these are very likely to participate in violence, etc. We see that in Tripoli. So I think both systems are producing uh, serious uh, uh, inequalities. And if you talk to the private sector, the priority for both, unfortunately, is of passing the official exams. That's uh, absolutely without a question. So, uh, and, and I think this is, comes back to the problem of defining our uh, educational philosophy, what, uh, uh, what we are for. So, but what happens with the private sector is that academically they can afford to cater for other sides. Uh, because they know that they can pass for the official exam, so maybe they do some extra curricular activities, etc., to make the school a bit more of a uh, enjoyable learning experience, but not necessarily always encouraging the social responsibility, etc., amongst the uh, kids. Um, so with the Arabic language, this is a very serious problem. What I was shocked when I was doing uh, the survey, and when we do many of the services that students 
and many private schools are unable to complete the survey in Arabic. So, uh, uh, so we have to translate and give it to them in a second language, which is uh, which is uh, quite uh, quite alarming. Um, as for the history debate, uh, okay, why do you teach history? Uh, Naila and I, Basil uh, and Khalil, we uh, all will uh, participate in the Association for uh, History Education and we're always arguing about it. Is it citizenship? Is it, uh, is, uh, for some people, they think it's just a discipline, like history. And you have to just train many historians. It's as simple as that. It's like science. Like math, you teach, uh, you train uh, people to become mathematicians, etc. So it should have no <laughs> other uh, objectives. Some people say no, it should uh, have other objectives. And we're still debating, and I guess that there's a personal uh, point of view on this. I'll give my very polemic answer. I think it's, um, you know, history is a teacher of life. I think it's a living matter. The past is how we lead our lives today. Uh, it's, it's a moral thing. It is, and if you don't look at it like that, as many historians try to, they say we want to be objective, we don't look at it morally and good and bad. They invariably do in some way. So why do I say this? Because again, I repeat what I said before. I think Lebanon has such a rich history in so many ways. And I, I don't think they should fear. There's a fear of history here, right? People don't want to, it's sort of like in a family, if you don't want to get the, the skeletons out of your, or take the skeletons out of your closet or your personal life, but you know at some point you have to face up to your past and integrate it into your present life. And it's, there's enough blame to go around on all sides, I think. Um, I uh, give you some examples before, I could give many more. I mean, look at the Shihab family, for instance, right? Being Christian at first, the Muslim conquests come, they become Muslim. Then uh, later the Shihab converts back to Christianity. And you have Fouad Shihab, who was, I don't think it's called fortuitous, that one of the probably best, most integrated British presidents we had in Lebanon was somebody from a family which does mixed Muslim, Druze, and, and Christian background. Um, so I, I think I, I disagree. I, mean, I think we have to face it head on. I mean, this debate has been in Lebanon for a different Bostani and others in the 30s tried to do this history book, and it caused a controversy then. Um, I think it can be done. I think the best book I've seen so far is by Joseph Shem, which is actually one with a lot of pictures in it, if you've ever seen it. And that series he has on Lebanon, it's wonderful. I mean, he goes from it's also horrifying some of it. But uh, I think it's a moral issue. And I think if you look at Syria today, for instance, uh, I had a student, a Sunni student in Doha. He told me from 2006 to 2008, in his classes, they got these preachers from Iraq who came in, and they were beginning the brainwashing and saying, basically, we're going to kill all the Alawites and we're going to expel all the Christians. And he's a Sunni student who was against Assad. But uh, he told me this, uh, that this was happening. And so they were being taught these things in school. So history kills too, right? So if, if you don't look at it uh, in an objective way, had they been taught, okay, yes, you have an Alawite regime, but there are poor Alawites too, or that, that some Sunni merchants are affiliated with the regime, look at it in a way it is, in a differentiated manner, then maybe these students wouldn't have been so easily won over by these uh, polemic and uh, demagogic preachers. So I think it serves a real moral and political function. I think the importance is the process, as you mentioned earlier, Maya, than the subject matter. Many parts of the world have solved it simply by presenting different stories for the students to be able to go through a process and then decide and figure out what they want to believe. What's bothering me and what we've been discussing now is they talk about the private and the public school system in Lebanon. Believe me, we have few very good public schools and few very good private schools, but most of our schools are in a very bad shape. Yes, there are so many different areas, but not all public schools are as bad as we think they are. And most of the private schools are not as good as we want them to be. And the problem of education in Lebanon is by far more deep-rooted. It's because teachers are not well trained, are not well paid, don't have the right place in society, and among other things. So it's not a black and white public versus private. Thank you.
Maybe you should tell us a little bit about your experience, exactly, that, what you found in the yes. schools and the work that yeah, the center has been doing. Yeah, I the findings. Some of them were public, some of them were private, and you find good practice and bad practice in, uh, in both. Some mix were doing quite well and others were doing terribly. Uh, one of the best schools was actually a fake school. Uh, so it's, uh, you cannot really generalize. There are a few cases that are really good, but on the board, <coughs> What's happening with us, as in many countries around the world, is exams dominates everything. Everyone is obsessed about the results. We kick students out just before the brevet because we want to make sure that we have 100% success rate. Uh, and we do the same for secondary. And then, you know, we have private schools and public, public unfortunately, they cannot kick them out. So, uh, so that's why they don't uh, have 100%, you know, when they don't have 100%. But that's the practice. In England, unfortunately, it has become I was horrified. I think in 2006, I saw also schools having signs, you know, success rate in GS, uh, GCSE. So uh, it's a worldwide phenomenon. We'll take uh, two uh, questions. Uh, uh, good evening. Uh, it's not working. So. Okay, I'll just speak loud. Uh, like, I would like to uh, speculate and ask you a question. On, uh, rather than focusing on the educational issue in Lebanon, if it was we, ha wouldn't it would be like more preferable to start changing the political uh, uh, status? Like, uh, everyone has their different uh, community, and then uh, after, <coughs> this is one of the roots of the problem. And and then if. Uh, there was a, a more civic status, like I, I like imagine, like in France, where like religion becomes irrelevant, and then wouldn't it be like easier in the end to build up a more, uh, in fact, not an agreement or a consensus on education, but after a while, really have a unanimous uh, uh, idea of what history is. So this may be like out of the sub subject tonight, but I wanted like to have your opinion about this idea. Thank you. We'll take a long question. Can you hear my voice? Can you come closer to the mic? It's working. It's working. Just okay, thank you. Um, I would like to go back a bit, uh, talk about the terms actually, terms used. Um, that will be having some, you know, some theoretical background related to the subject, like using, for example, terms of, um, about like uh, nationalism, uh, citizenship, education, uh, social cohesion. Um, um, from the presentation, um, I understood there is some maybe understanding about the similarities and differences actually about these, um, uh, between these terms in English, but in Arabic, there's not that clear distinction, especially when talking about nationalism versus citizenship education. Um, I, mean, I, I, I think maybe to disagree in this, uh, this, uh, this concept because um, if you maybe um, um, use the terms in, English, in Arabic um, and know the differences, uh, the linguistic difference between, for example, nationalism like wataniya, uh, 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 citizenship education, muwatana, uh, um, uh, social cohesion, Sometimes, like tamasuk al-ijtimai or al-insihar al-ijtimai, we we tend to find also the distinction in Arabic. So the muwatani and wataniya they are different, uh, different concepts. But I I do agree with you that the practice actually is different from the let's say English culture compared to some maybe Arabic uh, um, societies maybe in some Arabic cultures. Uh, or some other uh, countries. So this may be the distinction, I would say, between the terms and the practice. This is one of the things that uh, I want to, uh, to add. Now, this is important because, now, um, from discussion, um, um, I understood as if that we are taking the concept sometime, um, uh, or maybe uh, conceived uh, as uh, mutually, mutually exclusive, that if we, we are talking about uh, citizenship education, we, uh, it should be maybe sometime conflicting what we are saying about um, social cohesion, um, and because this is a narrow concept, this may be different, it conflicts social cohesion. While well, sometimes I can see it that in citizenship education, we're talking about the individual's right in the society, and the same actually in Arabic, um, um, but when it's social cohesion, we're talking about society, about the, um, the human rights actually within, the, the, within this society. So they're not, uh, not, not necessarily to be uh, uh, narrow concepts, 
I would say, as said, now talking about Muatin, uh, uh, for example. So uh, um, the, the question, did we reach this in our societies? That's a question. Now, the practice is different, but the theoretical underpinning, they're already there, and they need to be practiced. Thank you. We'll take the last question, and I think uh, we'll <coughs> It's not, I don't know if you can see me. <laughs> I'll move here. <laughs> it's, not, it's not really a question. I realize it's just an opinion I'd like to share with you. But I'm just trying to I'm just gather, just trying to map out everything I learned from today. And I think from the themes that came up about sectarianism, history, war and memory, education, nationality, identity, and social cohesion. And I was thinking about social cohesion specifically because Dr. Kiwan and yourself were talking about it. And um, you, you, you focus on how, when we're talking about social cohesion, we also need to focus on social justice. I think something interesting that none of us brought up, but Dr. Hanafi sort of um, brushed upon was that, forget the history part for now, but I think what's also important is to teach the kids and this youth um, who is responsible and who should be held accountable. Uh, for most of for most of the war crimes that have happened, and I think that's what part of social justice is for us. And I think maybe, perhaps, I'm just throwing it out there that part of the social justice allows us also to create this sort of uh, uh, this common ground that we were talking about, this common denominator that we understand there there's this there's people that could be held accountable, and that's what social justice could mean. And that is one way that could, I don't know, develop maybe social cohesion, which is also based on our nationality. Um, and also goes back to social contract, which is something, well, one of the terms that have come up. Um, and maybe the role also that you discussed, of civil society organizations and their initiatives. Because the schools have this boundary that are not allowing, again, the process to discuss and criticize, uh, perhaps in civil society organizations, which do encourage these things, um, that social contract can be rewritten or reformulated with the help of the, with the help of their initiatives, rather than just focus on school and the school boundaries. Okay, um, I'll tr I'll try and just address a few comments to um, the young man at the back who talked about um, not just talking about social cohesion in terms of education between society and then also Sally's comments about accountability. Um, I mean, I think I would agree with, um, with w what you're saying, that we need to think about social cohesion outside of this, the, the narrow domain of the school and the school gates. Um, where I may differ from you or disagree is I don't think we can necessarily superimpose um, a civic republican notion of citizenship in Lebanon, and I think that relates to the comments made by the gentleman on this side, that we have to think about where we are in Lebanon, not necessarily where we want to be or should be, and go step by step. And that's why in my talk, I um, talked a bit about the experience of um, social cohesion, aims of social cohesion um, in policy domains beyond education, so namely uh, in, in naturalization. Um, and uh, in terms of thinking about social cohesion, in terms of social justice, I, um, I think you're raising something very interesting when you're talking about accountability. And I think it can relate, in a sense, of when we talk about social cohesion, we tend to think about it, oh, let's all see if we can all get along from different groups, in different groups. Um, but as I, as I mentioned in my talk, I think that emphasis on the horizontal relationship is a means for government not to take accountability seriously and not to take responsibility by having all sorts of initiatives um, that are about you know bussing people in you know all playing football matches together being happy and having you know these sort of fun sort of soft fuzzy kind of experiences is avoiding the issue of accountability that the state needs to take and that's what's important is that, that that vertical relationship is strengthened. And that can only be done if the different groups at least have a perception that they're being treated fairly by government. And so I think what, what you're saying about accountability is, is a critical part of thinking about social cohesion 
and social justice is, is spot on. just comment uh, on your question is I think the issue of definition, defining terms, and when we move them even to Arabic, uh, tra translating them to Arabic even creates a greater headache. When I think about social cohesion in English, and I think about al ijtima'i or tamasuk ijtima'i, other words and meanings come to my head. So there's there's a big issue with uh, with, the ter with the terms themselves. And that's why actually in the book we don't really offer a definition, a very clear definition, but we focus on the theory underpinning this. And we focus a lot on actually defining social justice. Because um, I personally feel it is far more important to, uh, to focus on this, because it will as a result focus on the, on the process and, what, and the policies that will come out of it. So um, I know I haven't answered the question uh, fully, but we can do that. Uh, uh, later. Uh, Alexander, I think uh, I'll just take the last question or comment and then just got a very short. Ah, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, I just got a very small comment about accountability. Um, I quite like to have history and accountability that as a kind of, you'd have the, the history going like that, but you'd have multiple accountabilities. So you'd have Starting, you know, the Middle Ages, you'd have accountability, and you'd have it just running through like that, chopping up, accountability, accountability, and all these accountabilities would be completely different because at one one day somebody's accountable, the next day somebody else is accountable, but the reasons for them being the way they are is going to go back in history. So I think the history is very important, and then to see understand why somebody is accountable today, uh, who seems to be accountable, but you know, five, 50 years ago, in fact, was the, was the one who wasn't accountable. So I think without understanding accountability in its broadest sense, we're going to make some very rough judgments. Okay, the last question from Professor Abu Asli. Uh, I had a question for you, but uh, we'll take your comment. This is not a question, but it's some of my comments. Uh, first of all, I will uh, thank you, Maha, for your uh, effort to lift uh, our award. And uh, I have to clarify one point regarding the book of history or the unified book of history. As I led the committee of history from 1996 19, till 1999, the objective, the main objective of the history of to develop the curriculum uh, of history is not to impose one idea, one opinion. It was to create some ambience of debate, discussion between different uh, students with different opinions and to respect, respect each other. And uh, as uh, who are here about the document, the document it, uh, the main <coughs> issue was how to uh, can defend our idea or our opinion based on some evidence or some document. And uh, the ultimate objective was to create a national, uh, national, uh, national debate from South to North and the Beirut for the same uh, uh, theme. Uh, for example, we, one, one of uh, the theme what we, uh, we uh, wish to develop is for, for example the, the uh, history. For example, the, the, some um, uh, ask about the, what the role of history and the social cohesion. Uh, the, uh, the role of history is to learn us the mistake of the past and to repeat this, not to, to not repeat the same mistake in the future. Uh, for example, and to enhance the uh, social cohesion. So. It wasn't a, like a, to impose one book, one, uh, one sentence, or one <coughs> idea, is to create some ambience and to, uh, discussion between, uh, to develop the, uh, the curiosity of different uh, opinion in the same uh, class. Thank you. Which is that they came very close, right? You, you had six historians, Muslims and Christians each, right? And you came very close. There was only one little word. I mean, uh, they basically had an agreed book, as I understood it. Maybe. 
No, uh, the, 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 the committee was formed from six people, three invisible, not three invisible, and we uh, came up with a one, right. one curriculum signed by the old representative of all party in Lebanon and uh, approved by the Council of Ministers in uh, March, uh, 27 March 1997. Okay, thank you very much all for coming and for uh, waiting. Uh, I mean, it's seven o'clock now. Um, thanks. Thank you.